while I deliberately left El Greco out of my first mannerism lecture. I'd already gone on long enough. You probably thought way too long. And I didn't want to rush through this wonderful painter and his work. This is one of my real favorites. I'm also not sure that he really belongs hanging out with all those Italians. He was born a Greek, trained as an icon painter, and El Greco did spend some time studying in Venice and taking in the works of Titian and Tintoretto. By the way, I think you'll see more influence from Tintoretto than Titian, even though he apparently worked in Titian's work, uh, workshop. But to my mind, El Greco, his Greek origins notwithstanding, is really quintessentially Spanish. Mannerist Europe was entering into an age of religious wars. We've been talking about that. Uh, but Spain, you have to understand, had been on the front line of religious warfare for a very long time, really since the Muslims conquered the country in the 8th century. So Spanish Catholicism was, from the beginning, a kind of crusader Catholicism, sharpened by 700 years of war to retake the country for Christendom. This is a country that was very serious about its religion. It was also heavily influenced uh, by a mystic strand. I don't know how much you know, for instance, about St. Teresa of Avila, uh, who sought union with God and Christ through visions and spiritual discipline, was actually named... Uh, a doctor of the church. So El Greco spent his last 37 years living in Spain, specifically in Toledo, soaking up its fervent spiritualism, capturing its stark light. Spain has a very different, harsher light uh, than Italy and certainly than Northern Europe. So I'm just going to say it. This is a cheesy video. It's a travel video, but I couldn't find a better one. And I like that it gives you some background on El Greco and a chance to look at some of his paintings, including the painting featured in your textbook, The Burial of Count Orgaz, in its setting in the parish church where it still hangs. This is really a good example of a work uh, that is so much better to see in place. It's so huge, it's so imposing, it so clearly belongs in its home church, so put it on your list. Uh, first, watch this little travelogue, and then we'll take a closer look at the painting itself. So El Greco painted almost entirely in Toledo, where Count Orgaz was a legendary figure much revered by the local people. So the theme of the painting comes from a 14th century legend about him. He was, again, a native of Toledo who died in 1312. He was a very pious man, and among other acts of charity, he left a large sum of money to enlarge and adorn the church of Santo Tome, which was El Greco's parish church, and it was the a parish priest who commissioned this work. So at any rate, according to the legend, at the time the count was buried, St. Stephen and St. Augustine descended in person from heaven and buried him with their own hands in front of an astonished congregation. You could imagine they were astonished. In other words, this guy was a local hero. So look at this painting for a minute and think about this basic question. What principle drives the fundamental composition. This has this painting has a clear compositional plan. Well, I think it's pretty easy to see that El Greco divides the universe of this painting into a lower earthly sphere and a higher heavenly sphere. And those spheres are painted very differently, really using quite different styles. So Earth is portrayed realistically and really in the style of El Greco's Venetian training. Um, although you do see some manners conventions, the pale, elongated, aristocratic faces, for example. But the heavenly spheres just explode into contorted shapes, jarring tertiary colors, whirling movement. And notice how strongly this contrasts with the solemn still figures below. I think we tend to think about, you know, life on earth being, you know, frenetic and wild and heaven as being a calm place that we get to escape to when it's all over. Uh, but El, in El Greco's vision, uh, the world is sort of calm and fixed and the heavens are filled with light and movement and excitement. Actually, in many ways, it's a more satisfying spiritual, vi spiritual vision. It's also a mannerist universe, but it's one that is uniquely El Greco. There's really no other mannerist painter quite like him, although I think Tintoretto's Last Supper has a little bit of the same feel, if you remember that from our last lecture. 
So here are two contrasting details uh, that really bring out the difference in how El Greco uh, composed and colored the inhabitants of the two spheres. But even in his so-called realistic sphere, uh, you still see these elongated, and I would say rather Byzantine faces. In fact, mannerism really harkens back uh, in many ways to Byzantine. That influence remains very much alive uh, in in Italy and here in this case in Spain uh, via El Greco. Okay, this is my personal favorite among El Greco's uh, paintings. I was startled that your textbook included only one El Greco painting, and I, I just couldn't live with that. So you saw some other El Greco works in the cheesy video, and here are some more. As I said, this is my favorite. It's actually one of two views of Toledo that El Greco painted uh, of his adopted hometown. You know, it's interesting that although El Greco was quite popular in Spain, he kind of touched a chord, fit in with the, the mystical, fervent Catholicism, uh, he actually didn't have a lot of influence over the direction of Spanish painting. We're about to start seeing uh, Spanish painters in a serious way. Velázquez, then we'll be moving toward Goya. Um, but you aren't going to see them looking much like El Greco until we get uh, to another very famous uh uh, Spanish painter. Any guess who I'm thinking of? Picasso. Basically, El Greco enjoyed a renewed popularity in the 19th and 20th century, especially with the Expressionist school. That, by the way, is the generation that rebelled against their moms and dads, who were the Impressionists. So, check out this side-by-side -side comparison of the view from Toledo uh, with Van Gogh's famous, I bet you know this painting, Starry Night, which is we haven't gotten there yet, an expressionist work. And I think this is very cool. So this on the left is El Greco's scene from Re Revelation. Uh, St. John is witnessing the opening of the fifth seal. And it's next to one of Picasso's most famous works, The Demoiselle of Avignon. Uh, and he uh, claimed that he was inspired in part by El Greco. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about Demoiselle of Avignon, very weird painting, very famous and important painting. But by the time we're doing that, we're going to be nearing spring break and the end of the course. A nice thought, isn't it? Ah, and I thought you all would like this. I've never seen this before. Um, but when I was looking at images of El Greco paintings, figuring out which ones to inflict on you, I saw this and thought, oh, that's one of our favorite scenes. By the way, I could easily imagine the college board picking an El Greco that had not appeared in any of the major textbooks and asking students to identify the painter. His style is so distinctive that you should recognize an El Greco. And that's one of the reasons that I showed you more than the measly single painting that your stingy textbook provides. Uh, I really am going to move on reluctantly in just a minute, but as I thought about El Greco as a mannerist, I found myself rebelling a little against the label. Yes, we certainly see mannerist elements in his work. The distorted, unrealistic bodies, the pale complexions, the elongated faces and torsos and hands, those jarring tertiary colors, uh, the just lack of I mean, the unreality, if you will, of many of the paintings. Still, I think El Greco really defies categorization. And another artist who struck me this way earlier in this course is the illustrator of the Ebo Gospel, by the way, an artist I had never uh, encountered until preparing for this course. Remember, this is back in the Carolingian era before Christmas break. Uh, so I was so struck by these. I showed this and some of the other Ebo Gospel illustrations to some people who were having dinner over at our house, about half of whom actually teach one thing or another at Stanford University. They also, none of them had ever seen this before, and they were all astonished to learn that this was an early medieval work. I mean, this is, you know, before Romanesque, before Gothic, very early medieval. And that's because this artist, like El Greco, gives off a kind of modern vibe. He also seems to have a very personal, unique style. Uh, and by the way, I put these together because they're both paintings of St. Matthew. So at any rate, by all means, learn your art historical period. You will need to know them for the art history exam. Uh, but, you know, avoid reducing great artists to stereotypes and appreciate individual style, even as those of you uh, who are aspiring artists, and I know some of you are, you know, are looking to develop your own personal style. Well, having dawdled over El Greco, I am going to move much faster now, I promise. 
Well, the distinction between Mannerist and Baroque sculpture is really a lot vaguer than the distinction between Mannerist and Baroque painting. I doubt that the College Board is going to go there. I mean, if they if they show you something like this, I think they'll give you Mannerist or Baroque as a choice, but not both. So the sculptor of this uh, work, Benevento Cellini, is really better known for his R-rated autobiography, uh, all about uh, how he seduced his models, etc. Uh, and, and also also his depiction of life in the court of the French king of Francis I. Uh, he does have some famous sculptures. Your book doesn't have the most famous, really, which is a sculpture of Perseus that he did for Cosimo I of Florence, and I probably should have included it, but we're all getting long. So any guess as to why this sculpture of Diana, the goddess of the hunt, and her patronus, the stag, I hope you know that is not the term Cellini would have used, but I think it's appropriate here. Why would this have been considered mannerist? Well, the torso is twisted and elongated. The head is unnaturally small. Uh, the whole impression is kind of courtly and stylized, artificial, if you will. And, of course, the sensuous pose probably appealed to the French nobles who weren't noted for their good behavior. Uh, but I would not be just shocked to hear this described as Renaissance for its classical scenes and proportion, uh, or Baroque for its twisting sensuality. So in the same way, the twisting, spiraling composition of this work and the way it really kind of moves out of its block of stone and into the negative surrounding space, that seems Baroque to me. Uh, I like this comparison with our favorite Hellenistic sculpture. I didn't come up with it. I got this slide. Uh, and I would encourage you to keep that comparison in mind. The Baroque response to the calm classicism of the Renaissance actually reminds me a lot of the Hellenistic response to classical Greek sculpture. So, let's put some action and feeling into those stone figures. Uh, the College Board loves to ask you to identify the period of sculpture that interlock on a vertical axis in a spiraling movement. Uh, and they will probably be looking for the answer Baroque, not Mannerist. In just a little bit, we're going to see more sculptures like that. But what's significant in art history about this work is it's the first large-scale sculptural group since classical antiquity that was designed to be seen from multiple viewpoints in multiple directions. We've seen uh, there was the statue of Hercules and Antaeus. I probably should have stuck that in here uh, that we saw earlier. But again, that was a very small piece. This is a monumental, large-scale sculpture. We're going to start seeing much more adventuresome shapes in sculpture. Well, by contrast, this building is pretty unambiguously mannerist, if only because it's really one gigantic uh, effort to make fun at Renaissance style. So we're back to thumbing our noses at the older generation. This is a rural villa, and you see all sorts of weird playing around with classical patterns. The stones are irregular. The keystones seem about to slip out. Uh, you have interrupted pediments. Uh, basically, this building is one large stuck-out tongue, and that kind of makes it mannerist. Palladio, on the other hand, really seems clearly either Renaissance or neoclassical. And by the way, that's a school of art we haven't encountered yet, but to give you a glimpse into the future, it is, as you may have guessed, the younger generation's rebellion against Baroque. Uh, this is one of his designs for rural villas outside Venice, where a lot of his buildings were built. So here's your question. Does this building look familiar? And if so, why? Well... The reason is that there are a whole lot of buildings that look a lot like it in America, especially if you walk down Constitution Avenue in Washington, D.C. Uh, the building on the bottom, do you recognize it? It's Thomas Jefferson's plantation home, Monticello. Uh, Jefferson loved Palladio's classical designs, and overall they were extremely popular in England and America. A lot of our government buildings have set show Palladio's influence. And just note, a uh, question about Palladio frequently appears on the AP exam. It's easy. I mean, you very recognizable. Think American classical style, Federalist style, and you've got Palladio. Uh, this, by the way, makes the design a little clearer. Notice you have a central plan with four identical facades and porches, each offering a different view of the surrounding countryside. Uh, it was a Belvedere 
built on a hill for views. And this is really, I mean, it's a very practical design. Uh, you go out on the porch and enjoy the, enjoy the view, you know, sip your drink, have your friends out. Uh, they were very livable designs as well as very beautiful, which is why uh, they've really been abidingly popular. You do not see a lot of would-be mannerist villas or even uh, hyper-baroque buildings floating around, but we're still building things that look like the designs of Palladio. Uh, so here's another famous Palladio building, the Church of San Giorgio Maggiore in Venice. Again, this is a high Renaissance work. It just happens to show up at the end of the mannerism section of your textbook and at this point in my slides. Uh, it also clearly does not belong in a lecture on Baroque architecture, and you're going to see why very soon, because Baroque architecture or Italian Baroque architecture and sculpture is where we're heading next.